You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBgive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBgive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator, and it's your one-stop source for information on giving, and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor. American criminal justice. We have the presumption that a person is innocent until they are proven guilty. And in recent times, that presumption has been challenged by our bail system. We've seen evidence that our bail system unfairly treats people of color. And so many are now looking at ways to redefine bail or to even eliminate it, or in the meantime, do things to create a more just, equitable, and fair bail system. And one of those organizations out there working on this is a group called the Bail Project, TBP, the Bail Project. And the the mission of the Bail Project is essentially to find ways to, to do just what I said. That is to try try to find ways to make, if possible, the bail system more fair. And if not, then to eliminate it altogether as being systemically broken and not able to be repaired. And here to talk with me about the bail project's work is my good friend, Brad Dudding, who is the chief impact officer for the bail project. And we're going to talk to him about what that is, what what is the chief impact officer. But before Brad joined the bail project, he worked 25 years at the Center for Employment Opportunity, CEO, which is a nonprofit headquartered in New York. And it's devoted to enriching the lives of citizens through employment. And as you've been listening to my podcast, you know that I also come out of, in my early career, the world of employment and training, having spent 14 years of my career with an organization called Opportunities Industrialization Centers that was training hundreds of thousands of people across the country. So we're kindred spirits, Brad, on that. And he's also held several other Uh, major senior positions in different organizations. And it's just so great to have him because he's an expert on measurement of performance and goal setting for organizations. And we can talk a little bit about that too. But I really want to know, Brad, about this work you're doing with the Bell Project and why you've become so motivated to take it on. Welcome to the show, Brad. Hi, Art. It's really great to be here. I'm a big fan of the, the podcast and, and a longtime admirer of your leadership in, in the, the social sector. So thank you for the opportunity to be able to talk with you and your listeners. Brad, I want to know, well, I know, but let's tell our listeners a little bit about you. And I love talking about my guests because what people see or hear in these podcasts are people who have accomplished amazing things in their lives and who have also set the stage for the success of many others. 
they've supported and developed uh, institutions that are making a difference in the world and are touching lives. But it didn't start out that way. Everybody has an origin and a story that kind of led to that. And if I were to ask you, what is it that got you connected to the social sector or creating a difference in the world? What would you say to that? Well, thanks for asking that question, Ari. It's not often I get a chance to reflect on my personal and professional journey. I think based on my identity as a white straight male and the privilege that I grew up with, it, it's somewhat improbable of you know where I where I ended up today. But let, let me give you just a little insight about how I think I got here. I think overall, uh, my journey can be summed up as generating a strong commitment to better understanding and addressing racial and ethnic disparities. That has really surfaced in all of my experiences in the social, social sector. I think the seeds for that were planted by my parents. It's probably not surprising. They were people that you know, espouse strong, small-D democratic values, you know, commitment to civil and, and human rights, the pursuit of happiness. Um, they were both teachers, so they had a strong commitment to public education. They were also very aware that, you know, their students came from different backgrounds and had different abilities to succeed based on resource constraints and, and barriers to certain opportunities. And that's something we talked a lot about um, at the dinner table. And that gave me initially at a young age some insight that my life was different than a lot of other people's life my age, especially black and brown people. And this was reinforced in my own schooling where I went to class, for example, with black kids. But the minute school was over, we went to separate neighborhoods and we weren't playing with each other after school. But there was, interesting, there was a creek between my neighborhood. And by the way, I grew up on White Avenue. If that gives you any idea of the kind of neighborhood I, brought, I grew up in, it wasn't very diverse. But there was a creek between my neighborhood and another neighborhood, a historical black neighborhood that was on the edge of an industrial area. And as a kid, there's nothing more fun than playing at a creek. There's so many things you can do there. And I just remember spending a lot of a lot of time there. And that was a place, interesting enough, where my friends and I would go to and we would encounter black kids because it was kind of a transition zone. It was an acceptable area where we could come together and play, which is if we each went to our own neighborhoods, it might it might not have been, um, you know, looked looked upon as favorably. Um, so that that was an early sort of lesson it just it generated curiosity in my life about what was driving this you know this this segregation this racial segregation and i grew up in st louis the north side was all black the south side was all white i really was curious about how that developed and so i became a student of you know how racial oppression uh, systemic racism kind of created that kind of spatial uh, segregation and I became a student of it, and I eventually went to grad school, became in, in urban planning to study that more. And then one of my first jobs coming out of grad school was at the Office of Managed Budget um, in New York City. And it was there where I first got introduced um, to the systemic impact of uh, the justice system. I, I took a job there as, as a unit head for the police unit, and I was sort of administrating the budget for the NYPD. And this was in the early 90s. Crime was peaking um, in New York City and many other cities. And one of the solutions under the Dinkins administration was to hire several thousand cops under a program called Safe Streets, Safe City. And, you know, not surprising at the time, the reaction to creating public safety was really was really a very focused law enforcement solution. And ironically, right now, I think we're in a time as crime is rising again, that we're having people that are starting to go to, let, let's think more about solutions that are based in law enforcement instead of the community. That that was an eye-opener. And it was there at, at OMB that I met an early mentor named Mindy Tarlow. She's 
Managing Director now at Blue Meridian Partners. And we had an opportunity to spin off a project at the, at the Veer Institute of Justice um, called the Center for Employment Opportunities, which was an experiment to help the employment journey of returning citizens coming home from prison, so people on parole, to help them find work. And we had a model in which we would help people find opportunities, get them job ready, and then to help stay in their jobs, uh, help them stay in jobs over time. And again, that was a model that was addressing unlevel playing field for mostly black and brown people. And we were able to develop results there. We jumped into a randomized control trial. We were able to get evidence to show that our program um, reduced recidivism uh, more than the control group, people that didn't get the services. And that was a real linchpin for CEO to get philanthropic funding and to scale across the country. And by the time I left, um, after serving in several senior jobs, uh, CEO was in about 25 different states. And they're one of the largest social service providers in the country, uh, separate from hospital systems and that kind of thing. Then, you know, I'm there. You mentioned earlier I was at CEO for 25 years. At some point, you need to decide if you want to do something else. I happened to meet Robin Steinberg, the founder of The Bail Project. Robin was a person that was committed to not the back end of the criminal justice system like CEO, but the front end, the pre-trial system, the, the time between uh, when a person's arrested and their case is disposed. And her career was committed to making that more fair and just. She started the Bronx Defenders, created the idea of the holistic defense model, and then did a pilot program called the Freedom Project, which was an early precursor to the Bail Project, which was paying bail for people in Queens and in the Bronx who couldn't get out of jail because they couldn't afford the cost of, of their bond. And so I decided to go to the Bail Project, help Robin scale up her startup, uh, and also build evidence to show that cash bail is unnecessary. And it's really been a privilege to work with these hundred or so people, freedom fighters, we, we call them, uh, to make sure that uh, freedom should be free in our criminal justice system. Well, how wonderful it must have been to grow up with a mother and a father who were educators and who, through their work, saw the inequities in our system, especially starting in education, you know, where most of us get our best opportunity to succeed in America because of our education. You know, even if those of us who are from communities of color know that education generally is the, the difference maker, yet it's hard to get. It's hard to get. You know, it's hard to get. I was reflecting on my parents and preparing for this, and it's like back in the day, in the 70s, it's like it seemed like teachers were just like another job. They weren't considered service providers. And I, I have a feeling that has something to do with my own journey of that they were providing us a human service and that rubbed off on me. Let's talk about the bail project because there is a problem and I want you to describe what you know the problem to be from a standpoint of numbers. And, you know, what are we talking about? Why do we need to tell our audience why we need to, uh, to deal with this? What's going on? Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to do that. Um, I think it's the issue of cash bail is something that people hear about, but they don't always know how. Well, let's, let me back up for a minute. Let me back up for a minute. I'm making an assumption here that everyone knows what bail is. So let's not make that assumption. Tell us what bail is and what, what its purpose is. And then let's get into the nature of the problem. Okay. So the, the purpose of cash bail is is to provide a practice of asking people who have not been found guilty of a crime to pay money up front to get their freedom to leave jail, or alternatively, they have to stay in jail until trial. So essentially, we have a, we've created a system, a pretrial system, in which to buy your freedom, and as you talked about at the beginning of, of this podcast, 
essentially there is a price on the presumption of innocence now in our country. So if you're arrested and it's determined that that you need to be booked into jail, that the state is going to bring charges against you, you're going to go before a judge, hopefully within 24 to 48 hours, and that judge is going to make a determination whether, A, can you be released on recognizance? B, do you need to be remanded to jail, meaning that because of your background, that you may be a th- in the current charges that are alleged, you might be a threat to yourself or others, and that you cannot be safely released into the community. Or the judge can decide you can be released, but there's a price for you to be released. And the reason a price is put on your freedom is because of a flawed assumption that there needs to be money. You have to have skin in the game for you to meet your obligation to come back to court. So in theory, it's a incentive. We think it's a false one that if you put up money, that means that to get that money back, you're going to show up for all of your court dates. Now, this goes way back centuries and, you know, to another time where, you know, someone could be arrested and they could jump on a horse and just disappear forever. You know, we now live in a society where it's very hard to, to disappear. Yes, there are some people that have a flight risk, but generally most people are not going to have the means or the ability to disappear. Again, it gets to the point that at the bail project, we just don't feel that cash bail is necessary. It's based on a flawed assumption and it violates individual rights of liberty and the presumption of of innocence. So now we think about people who are accused of a crime and they go to be arraigned by a judge. The judge, as you say, is going to decide a, they're too dangerous. So, or they're, and they're a flight risk and they might hurt somebody else. So in that case, we don't even want to give them bail. We just want to keep them in prison. And there are probably, in many cases, justification for that. Yes, and it's important to make a strong justification for it. We have, you know, basically in case law, you want to provide clear and convincing evidence. You want to, at that hearing, you want the prosecution and the defense lawyer to be there to listen to the arguments of the state to say why this person is potentially a public safety risk and for the judge to be able to weigh the evidence. And so let's assume then that the person isn't one of those folk, that we can't make that case. The state can't make that case. So therefore, the next level is to decide whether we're going to let them out. The only question is, are they going to have to pay to get out or are they going to have to come out on their own? Right. And the whole issue of paying to get out seems to be questionable because if you have money, Fine, you can pay it and, you know, you'll show up and get your money back. But if you don't have money, why should you have to be in jail simply because you don't have money? That's the question, right? That That's what we're trying to deal with right now. Plain and simple, right? Yes. That's a fundamental issue of what we're talking about. So we essentially that issue of having to pay for your freedom sets up a two tier system of justice. Mm-hmm. And you're probably aware of that famous quote by Brian Stevenson that says that we have a system of justice in the U.S. that treats you much better if you are rich and guilty than if you are poor and innocent. Mm-hmm. So essentially wealth, not accountability, not evidence determines your justice, your, your outcome. Let me get into this a little bit, Brad. So yeah. let's assume I'm a person who's been accused of a crime not so dangerous that they're going to keep me in prison. They're going to deny me bail, but they're going to decide that I need bail in order to get out. Let's assume I don't have money though. So they're going to put me in jail. Now, how many people are there like me in prison right now, waiting for a trial? People who, who would be out if they had money, but don't have money. And so they're in how many people are there like me in prison right now? Yeah, it's a really important question because the growth in the number of people that are detained pre-trial because they can't pay bail has been 
growing very significantly over the last 25 years. So in the 80s, there was about 100,000 people at any given time uh, sitting in jail pre-trial. Today, that number is is growing to close to 500,000. So on any given day, there are about a half a million people sitting in jail pre-trial. Now, there's a lot of ebbs and flows of who's in jail. So that half a million people, some of those people are going to be released the next day. Right. Some people are going to be remanded and some people are going to be given a, a, a cash bond. Yeah. We've estimated that based on, you know, there's essentially there's about 10 million people arrested every year in America. About 7 million of them are, or 5 million of them are, are booked into jail. Of that number, about half are that are ultimately released on recognizance. And then you've got another about two, two and a half million people every year that either are remanded to jail or they cannot afford uh, cash bail. So figure about a, a million three is the number we've estimated that every year have to sit in jail for days, weeks, months because they can't afford it could go as low as $100, $500. The average bail for a felony is about $10,000. Misdemeanor, it's going to be lower, two or 3000 We know that when we do surveys on family emergencies, how likely are you to come up with $500 if you have a family emergency? 50% of America can't come up with that kind of money. So you're, you're talking about a huge swath of the population that if they are incarcerated and they have cash bail set, that they cannot achieve that, that bail amount. And some people would, would say that that violates the Eighth Amendment around excessive bail. So let's continue on. So let's talk about the consequences of that. Right. Right. So, and let me, let me tell a story about a recent client that we had to just give you a sense of the harm that this potentially can create. So, and this story was just sent out over Thanksgiving on our social media cha- channels and on our website. And so we operate in Louisville and there was a woman there that reached out to us who was in jail. She was an African American woman, mother of six. She was arrested because she had an altercation with her neighbor. She was arrested, booked into jail and assigned a $25,000 bond, 10%. And so the 10% means that she or her friends or family can pay $2,500 for their freedom. She could not come up with that money. Her family couldn't come up with that money. Uh, So she reached out to the bail project and we researched her case. She met her eligibility. We paid her bail. She was released. We set her up on court reminders. We asked her, does she have any needs that she needs to be met? And we set her up with any services, with local service providers, if that was necessary. But had the bail project not been in Louisville, Adria would have, and that's her name, would not have been able to leave jail for weeks, if not months. Yeah, let's talk about that part. So how long are people in prison, and I say prison, I should say jail, how long are people in jail waiting for trial? The thing about American criminal justice systems are there are basically 3,000 different systems because there's 3,000 different counties with all their different procedures. But in the jurisdictions that we operate in, and we operate in about 25 jurisdictions in 18 different states, the average length of stay for those people pre-trial is probably four to six months. We want to get to people as quickly as possible because we realize even a day in in jail can uproot your whole life. If we get back to to Andrea's story, had she not been bailed out, she would have lost, very much likely lost her job. She works at an insurance company as a customer service rep. She's been there for seven years. She could have potentially lost custody of her children because she... She didn't, if she didn't have family to take care of her kids, her oldest son was just about to graduate from high school. She wouldn't have been able to see his graduation. So you can just, you can just multiply that situation 
you know, a thousand times every day about people's lives going up in smoke because they can't purchase their freedom. Wow. Okay, so how does the bail project work? You mentioned that you will put up money for a person's bail so that they can go free. But where does that money come from? So we have successfully raised tens of millions of dollars uh, to create a revolving bail fund. Now, revolving bail funds have been around for a century or more. They started most likely in black churches uh, where people, members of the church, pooled their money to bail people out that got involved in the system. Lately, over the last 10 years, there's been a lot more nonprofits set up as nonprofit charitable bail funds. And the bail project started, like I said, with a pilot in New York. And then our founder, Robin Steinberg, did a TED Talk on the bail system five years ago. I highly recommend checking it out if you want to learn more. That catalyzed some investment from the Audacious Foundation, which is a charity aligned with TED. And so that created our initial capital. From then, we, we raised other large uh, foundation grants. We got a large grant from Blue Meridian Partners to continue to grow the bail fund. Then after George Floyd, the issue of bail crystallized for a lot of people that weren't aware of the system. And so after George Floyd's murder, there was a lot of protest. A lot of protesters were thrown in jail and they had to pay bail to get out. And so we were able to raise millions of dollars at the bail project and other Bail funds did the same to bail people out and provide the services that people need once they get out. So we have this bail fund. We hire bail disruptors. That's their name. We want to disrupt the system. They do the research on clients. They get referrals from public defenders. They get referrals from the community. They do the research. They interview the client. It's a needs-based assessment. That's what we're looking to transform the system to, to a needs-based assessment not so much a risk-based assessment. Once we make our decision based on a decision-making framework, we bail them out, we meet them, we set them up on court reminders, transportation, and we stay in touch with them. And we also make sure if they have any needs that they want to meet voluntarily, to set them up with service providers in the community, whether that's housing, mental health, substance abuse, support, that kind of thing. We stick with them through the the pendency of their case. Once their case has disposed, our work with the client is essentially over. We have produced very strong outcomes over this five-year period. We have close to a 95% court show-up rate. So after you are released, you're given several court dates. You have to show up for court. Sometimes it can be two dates, three dates, four dates, five dates. It really depends on the system. We remind them each and every time. You know, I was reflecting on this the other day. When you think of like your dentist, how many times have you forgot about going to the dentist because you just didn't put it in your calendar? All it takes is a, is a text reminder. And you're like, oh, yes, I have to go to the dentist. It's really that simple for most people to get them back to court. They just have to be reminded. And our data has shown that. Another fact from the, our data is that one third of the people um, that we have bailed out, their cases have resolved in a dismissal, which raises questions about, wow. you know, should they have ever been arrested in the first place? Right. Um, there are a lot of reasons for dismissals, um, but a major reason is, is there just isn't evidence to prove guilt. And so in some of our jurisdictions, we see dismissal rates as high as 70 or 80 percent, which really uh, raises questions about law enforcement practices in that city. So let's look at the economics of this. If you are one of the people who are afflicted by this, you don't have money, but you're going to be put in prison. I keep saying prison because it might as well be prison. You just kind of locked up away for six months. <laughs> it's a cage. They both, the jails and prisons both have cages. But you're in, you're in this cage for six months potentially and somebody's paying to feed you not saying the foods all that but there's money to put you in there there's money to 
feed you. And if something happens to you, you got to get medical care. You got it all that the state has to pay, right? State has to pay for all this. And so we are talking about, you said 1.2 million people in this situation like this for three to six months. I mean, the numbers can add up pretty quick in terms of the burden financially on the state, particularly if a third of them are people who should never have been in there in the first place. Indeed. I mean, just imagine what we could be doing with all that money. I mean, if you just look at it from an economic standpoint, I'm not saying that's the, the only way to look at it. But if you just look at it from an economic standpoint, wouldn't we be better off taking that money and putting it into the training program? Not Now, not to mention, right, not to mention, Brad, that when you put these folk in, their lives are going to be turned upside down. They're going to lose their job. Some are going to lose their family. So six months later, after they do get out, they got to start all over again. People are going to know where have you been for six months? They can't find a job. They're going to now be in a real crisis situation. Potentially their kids are gone, right? If they had kids, the kids are either with the state, the state's taking care of them in the foster care system who God only knows where because they couldn't be with them for six months if they don't have people around them, right? So we, we have created an economic burden on our society for people who we don't need to be taken care of in that way. And we say that we don't have money. So I'm just, you know, I'm fascinated by this, this challenge because like so many things in life, we can sometimes, as they say, do things that don't turn out in the way we intend them to turn out. And we just keep doing it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Definition of insanity, right? We just keep doing it. I mean, I'm just thinking about, I'm just thinking about this and like, okay, this isn't financially viable. So let's keep doing it. I mean, what world right. would you say do that in? Now, yeah, I mean, if, if you think of just the collective investment, government investment in public safety, and by that I mean the cost of courts, the cost of law enforcement, the cost of corrections, it's mind boggling. I think it, it approaches probably 200 billion a year. Now, that's the full system. If you just look right. at pre trial, yeah. I've seen a number from the Vera Institute estimating 15, 15 billion a year um, goes to keep propping up the pretrial system. And that's increased dramatically 5X over the last 25 years. What was the number you said? Let's get there. Right. 15 million, 15 billion, sorry. 15 um, billion right. in the pretrial. To keep people behind in cages that have not been, that are, that are presumed innocent. And many of whom don't need to be in jail. I would say 99% don't need to be there. Well, we already said they don't need to be there because they're not violent. And we would let them out if they had the money. So we were just agreeing right up front they don't need to be there. Right. Because They've the judge, the judges yeah. agree that they don't need to be there because... They don't need to be there. Just give me the money, we'll let you out. Right. And we have evidence to show that cash bail, skin in the game... Skin in the game and cash bail is not needed. That all you need to be is all you need is a reminder to show up. So, yes, you could save billions of dollars and reinvest that in the community to really bolster public health and safety. Yeah. And I think, you know, what the challenge we have at the bail project and in criminal justice reform in, in general is just narrative change, right? Narr the, po the power of narratives, the, the law enforcement narratives of, of crime and punishment are very powerful. And when you tell anecdotal stories about a woman that was pushed, unfortunately pushed to her death, you know, on the subway tracks, or a woman whose husband was arrested for a domestic violence misdemeanor and 
came back, was released, and then came back and murdered his wife. Those stories have incredible power. They have fight or flight reactions in the human brain, Mm -hmm. but they're, they're the anomalies, right? There's hundreds of thousands of people that are being released, released, and they're moving on with their lives. It's hard to quantify the good in that, right? You know, it, it's hard to tell a Chris story about how well that's working. Um, so one thing that we need to do with the Bail Project is invest in better storytelling that can really start to convince people that this is going against the American way. This is going against the value of liberty and the presumption of, of innocence. And so that's our task over the next few years is to start to tell better stories to convince people that the system needs to change. Well, now you're the chief impact officer. So you have all the the information on this. What do you do there as a chief impact officer? Yeah, that's a question I get asked a lot because it's it's some somewhat of a new title in the, in the sector. Well, for um, me, I mean the impact is pretty straightforward to me. Yeah. I mean, but but anyway, I would I want to know like how you go about, you know, just uh yeah, assessing that and so forth because I don't think I think a lot of people, Brad, don't believe that nonprofits actually do this. Right. So it, it, here's another learning opportunity for for people who don't necessarily yeah. know. But go ahead. So I want to put that yeah. out there. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, well, one of my primary roles is really to help create the learning agenda for the organization and to based on that agenda. So which is basically questions on how we can achieve our mission, like how can we understand the reasons that someone wouldn't show up for a court appearance? What are the reasons why someone would stop connecting with us? What are the, what are the reasons that cash bail, the assumptions of cash bail don't pan out? So we have those questions and then we build evidence. Right. We have we have a way to collect data and build evidence to answer those questions and then to use that data to advocate for change. So when you ask me what I do as a chief impact officer, I want to make sure those those knowledge building activities are happening, that we're asking the right questions, that we're engaging staff, um, that we're using data, not just collecting it, but using it to get better. So a lot of this has to do with making sure that you have the plumbing to collect all this data, right? For us to be able to tell stories that are data informed. So I I think a lot about in my job, you know, what is the data we need to collect, how we can analyze it, how we can help our staff feel empowered empowered by the data, because this does probably doesn't surprise you, Art, but there is a, a pretty big data gap in some of our organizations around the ability to actually use data to manage to outcomes. And so I think a lot about how we can do that effectively and increase the literacy um, or just the the comfort level with using data uh, to meet our mission. Good. Well, I can say this, as I said before, it's pretty straightforward to me. You have a situation where you're wasting billions of dollars and you don't have to. And the evidence is right there in front of you. So. Yeah. And we, and as I said, we just have to take that sort of common sense thinking and educate as many people as we can and just tell stories to confirm it. And that's how you get narrative change and system change ultimately. Yeah. Now, this is America. And so we can't have this conversation without pointing out the huge racial disparities also. Right. So. Yes. We're not talking about generally, well, generally we are, but there's a disproportionate number, I'm sure, of people of color who are tied up in this I can't pay bail system, right? Indeed. What did are, what are the statistics say on that? Yeah, so for jail, the numbers that I've seen recently that they're, black people are three times as likely to be incarcerated pre-trial than white people. And interestingly, even during COVID, when jail populations 
were reducing and even the number of black and brown people in, in, in jail was being reduced. In some cases, and this is data from the MacArthur Foundation, the proportion of black people who were in jail pretrial even increased despite the fact that overall populations for all groups declined and even the black population in jail. So there, there's a real challenge with racial bias in our system. That's no surprise to you and your listeners. Um, and that is another reason why bail should be disposed of because cash bail increases those racial disparities immensely. Now, there was some good news on the prison side that came out recently that over the last 20 years that the the black rate of imprisonment compared to whites actually fell by 40%. But black adults are still imprisoned five times more likely than, than whites. So we still have a lot of work to do. That decline in disparities in the jail system did not happen. If anything, the disparities in the jail system are increasing or trend or flatlining at this time. Well, look, Brad, I, I could probably have this continue on for another hour and a half or something, but I think we got the major point here. What are you guys doing to change it? What do you, well, first of all, what do you think needs to change? How do you change it? And what do you, what needs to change? Yeah, well, I talked about the narrative change and the capturing the the hearts and minds of the public, and that's going to affect how politicians address this issue. So we just went through a midterm election. I think surprisingly in a lot of jurisdictions, um, the fear of crime was not the major difference maker. However, in the state of New York, where bail reform has been ongoing for the last few years, um, it did have a major impact on a lot of congressional races. And it didn't seem like Democratic candidates were willing to defend uh, the bail reform legislation. I don't really know the reason for that. Uh, they maybe just thought it was better just not to talk about it. Um, and what happened was in New York that, you know, five congressional seats basically flipped to Republicans. Uh, it had a lot to do with the crime narrative. So we really... To get change, we really got to figure out a way for people to talk about why bail reform is a very American thing to do. It aligns with some of our basic principles and values. And so, like I said, that's one thing the bail project is very focused on. In the meantime, we're going to continue to address the humanitarian crisis in jails and continue to bail out as many people as possible. But our goal is not to continue to bail out people. We want to go out of business, right? That's our goal. We, we don't want to be talking about this. You need to go out. Of, you need to go out of business. We do. So are you talking about eliminating bail altogether or are you talking about reforming it? What are you talking about? We would love to eliminate it. Again, this is going to have to happen in all 50 states. You know, so bail is set by statute. So this is something that's going to take a while. We've made progress in New York. Illinois is eliminating cash bail on January 1st. We contributed to that reform effort. So it's going to be one state at a time. In the meantime, we're looking for other ways to reduce pretrial detention in all the jurisdictions we're in. So if it's not at the state level, we're going to be working at the local level with county executives, with law enforcement, with sheriffs to find out can we think of other ways to reduce the number of people incarcerated pre-trial? The Bail Project has a model that we call community release with support. So you release people on recognizance and you give them support so that they can return to court and not get involved in the system again in the future. And that's something that we're now piloting in Chicago. As cash bail ends, we're going to continue to provide services for people and providing court reminders for people who are released on recognizance. So that's a major thing that we're doing in the future. We're going to test that. We're going to evaluate it. And hopefully that can be a model for the rest of the country. But just to maybe to wrap up, I mean, our vision is ultimately 
to make sure that pe people are treated humanely in the criminal legal system, you know, that their right of liberty and the, the presumption of innocence is preserved. We need to shift the public's thinking on this. We are imagining a world where the majority of people are not subjected to the harm of pretrial incarceration. No one sits in jail because they can't afford a cash bail amount. So that's what, that's the kind of world that we're trying to create. And we're getting there. It's, it's going to require patience. It's going to require people getting into the weeds on what this is. And it's going to require narrative change. Yeah. And again, like I said before, it's a privilege to be part of this, this effort with my fellow colleagues. No, as you're making a difference. And I, I just think about maybe a lot of people think about this as we're going to let dangerous people back out on the streets if there's not a bail system. And it has nothing to do with that. It really has zero to do with that. So if, if there's anything we got to do with that narrative, we got to get people thinking, no, 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 no. The people who need to be in there are in there. These are people who are only in there because they don't have money. That's that's the only reason that they're in, right? That's what we're talking about. Yes. And I just think that, you know, we got to make that clear to people, you know. Yeah. The judge has discretion. They make the decision if someone is a public safety risk, everyone else should be released based on the presumption of, of innocence to get on with their life. It can happen. Well, Brad, thanks for joining. This has been very edifying. And I know that people who are listening who don't pay a whole lot of attention to the pre-trial system that we have in the country have learned something. And maybe some of you will want to join in these efforts in some way. What can people do? Well, people can go to thebailproject.org to find out more about how the systems work and how the bail project is trying to change the system. Of course, we're always looking for additional support. You can become a regular su subscriber, a uh, regular donor. You can donate one time. You can donate once a month. Your donations will be going to, to build our bail fund and to support our bail disruptors in this incredibly inspiring work. We like to say freedom should be free and your dollars will be going to that effort. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. And you know you can find us on all major podcast platforms. And in addition to what you just heard from Brad Dudding from The Bail Project, there are at least 120 or so interviews that we've done now that you can take some inspiration, some knowledge, some people who are going to push you over the edge to get involved if you haven't been already. And if you have been and you're at a day where you just need a little motivation, they'll give you that too because of what they've done. And if you want to support the Heart of Giving podcast, you can do that also by going to our website, give.org and making a donation. Thank you for listening. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.